actually we are not just i guess um thank you for joining me so full disclosure i had this really brightly colored fun um slide presentation for you all but technology doesn't want to cooperate today so um, i'll share it some other time somehow with you all um because it was really fun i had a lot of fun making it so um i'll be sharing that with you um so i'll introduce myself to you first i am tiffany jewel uh, i wrote this book oh, i have two copies right here <laughs> this is the one that i use for everything um this book is anti-racist uh, 20 Lessons on How to Wake Up, Take Action, and Do the Work. And it was illustrated by Aurelia Durand, who's an amazing illustrator based out of Paris, France. And she also spends a lot of time in Copenhagen. And if you're able to follow her on um, social media, she's amazing. And every day, like, comes up with brilliant, brightly, beautiful, bold illustrations. So just a few things while we are here, um, I'm kind of setting some ground rules, I guess I would call them. They're um, take care of yourself. So if you need to drink water, I'm gonna do that now too. Because we gotta stay hydrated, it's summertime. Um, take care of others, take care of this virtual environment. So if you like see in the chat that somebody has a question or something about like, what was that book? What was this? You can, uh, if you know, if, if, um, you can just pop that into the chat too. Um, take care of this virtual environment. So, and that goes, part of that is um, we'll have some time for questions and answers. Be mindful of how much space you take up. I always ask um, folks of the global majority to take up space and folks who are white, um, who have your Western European, European ancestry to um, be mindful of the space that you're taking up. So that's something that just kind of notice within within you and what's going on with that. Um, the other thing is uh, the chat. You can use the chat to ask questions and say hi and everything. We'll be using the chat for ourselves too. And that is a place where you can, um, I've got some, some work for us to do today. The other thing is there's no space for hate speech here. Uh, I, will do, I will not tolerate it. I have no patience for it. You'll be removed if you're sharing anti-Black, oppressive, inappropriate language, just like that. Um, so just knowing that too. So if you're able to, in the moment, if you're here, just like let me know you're here. Um, you can say your name if you want to, pronouns that you prefer to use, where you're from if you like. Uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep talking too. So before we kind of begin into this work too, there are a few things that I would like to acknowledge. So first I wanna um, remind you that we are on stolen land. So I share this work with you from my home, which resides on the traditional lands of the Pakumtuk and the Nipmuc. I've been learning a lot this summer about whose land I'm on and the history that has, um, that pulled, pushed, forced the Pakumtuk and the Nipmuc away from their traditional lands. And um, I did a lot, like that research can be found. A lot of your uh, local tribal councils hold that information. So I encourage you to do that work. There's the Native Land app, which is an amazing app um, that can just kind of help you start that journey to figure out whose land you're on. Uh, one of the things that I also do because this land is, uh, has given me life and has, um, is home to my children and home like provides us with a garden and everything that it's important for me to redistribute my funds to schools and organizations that support, um, indigenous language reclamation and sovereignty. So those are some of the ways that we are actively working in our home to acknowledge the land that we are on. I also wanna acknowledge 
that I am a black biracial person and I'm also very light skinned. And that makes me much more palatable to all of you. It's easier for you to listen to me, for you to, to believe me. Um, I'm taking up space right now. And I also need, like, need to acknowledge and say that I need to do better at yielding space to my darker sisters and my darker brothers. Um, this is another form of racism and we'll get into it a little bit too, where uh, folks who are lighter are the ones um, who we often go to, listen to, accept um, more easily. So those are just a few things that I wanna, wanna shout out. So I don't know if you have this book. Um, if you don't, you can get it. It's in stock. Like it's been out of stock in so many places, but it is in stock at Barnes and Noble right now. So you can get it. Um, and I wrote this book for everybody. I really did. And I wrote it thinking about uh, what nine-year-old me needed and wanted and what 14-year-old me needed and wanted and what um, I want to sh share with my children and my students. So just letting, reminding you, this is for everybody. I've seen a lot of adults reading it and that is really exciting to me. And I'm walking you through a journey from understanding yourself to the world around you and, and further, kind of and beyond. Um, so kind of a few things. I wanna talk about identity. I am Tiffany Jewell. I use she, her pronouns. I am black biracial with light skin privilege. I am a cisgender female. So I walk through the world presenting with the parts that I was born with. When the doctor told my mom, you've got two girls, I still walk th through the world like those two girls. Well, I say two because I'm a twin sister. Um, I'm a first generation American. I'm a glasses wearer. Um, and I just recently bought my first pair of reading glasses. So I'm um, entering into a new phase of my life. I am a mama. I'm a Montessori educator. I'm an author. I'm a chocolate lover, especially like I like milk chocolate and I like milk chocolate with salty caramel. Uh, I'm a home bread baker. And I'm so much more. So this is a list that I could go on with forever. Some of these um, parts of me change and some of them don't, but it's an exhaustive list. And it's important for me to share with you that I am a whole person of many parts and you are too. And this is one of the first chapters in here is all about identity. We're whole people. And a lot of times we get asked kind of about one part of our identity, the part that uh, people see kind of instantly through the world um, without recognizing that there's so much more to us. So who are you? And I mean that in the nicest way. Who are you? What are some of the things about you? What are some of the things in your identity? If I asked you, and I'm going to, just to share in the chat, just to start with I am, what more do you, would you have to share? I am a gardener. I am, I am very allergic. I'm having a lot of um, seasonal allergies happening around me too. So just share in the chat some of the things that you are, um, parts of your whole self. You can share one thing, you can share two. Uh, one of the things that I ask you to do in this book is anti-racist and I've asked my students to do and we're doing identity work is to share, um, you can either write it in a list form or what we call an identity map. And an identity map is really fun because it's like a map of who you are. And here's the thing about your identity too, is you are claiming this for yourself and nobody else gets to tell you who you are. There are parts of us that are informed by our families, by the people around us, our friends, our neighborhood, our classroom, but you are, you name yourself. Sorry, as I sniffle. And this is, I just wanted to share like the, one of Aurelia's amazing illustrations. I don't know what this looks like for you. Um, 
but I loved, I love going through all of these. I'm loving seeing all of the different parts of your whole selves. I'm an English speaker. I was born and raised in the United States. I'm a central New Yorker at heart. Um, Syracuse is where I call my original home. So I don't know if you know anything about Syracuse, New York, but it's almost like orange and snow run through my blood. <laughs> Um, so many different things. I am a lover of trees and being outside, even though it makes me sneeze so much and all the time. But remember, these are just little parts of us that we're sharing and there's so much more. And I love keeping these lists and keeping my identity map and share, like adding to it and changing it over time. We've been doing this in our family. Um, and it's really fun to see how the eight-year-old just like keeps adding things to the list and the four-year-old's like, I'm done. This is who I am. Like, I'm gonna present myself as who I am. There are two different, well, there's a whole lot to our identity, but there are kind of like two categories that I think about a lot. There's our social identities and our personal identities. And our social identities are the identities that have been created, named, and framed defined by society. They are um, kind of steep categories that we often go to first. They include our race, our ethnicity, our gender uh, expression, our language, our citizenship, our religion, our schooling, our age. And those are kind of very like defined boxes and they're the ones that people often argue over too. They're like, it's very like binary thinking. You're either this or you're that, or you're like this or that. Um, there's not a lot of fluidity in there. And then there's our, um, our personal identity. And these are created, named, framed, and defined by you, by me, by us. It's ourselves, myself. This is the you that might relate to others. And it's the you that also might not relate to anybody else. While our social identities are really about how we relate to other people in society. So an example, my social identities, I'm black biracial, I'm a cisgender female, I'm middle class, I have American citizenship, I'm an English speaker. Um, and those are just some of them. There's a whole bunch more too. While my personal identity, I'm a home bread baker. I'm an author, I'm a twin sister, I'm an optimist, I'm a chocolate lover. So those are kind of the two differences. And the beautiful thing about identity, like I shared before, is some of them are, stay with us the whole parts of our lives. And we just maybe understand them a little differently as we grow and we change. Like I was born a black biracial kid. I'm still a black biracial adult. My understanding of my identity has changed tremendously though. The words, the language that I've used to describe myself and the language that I've allowed people to use to describe me has also changed over time. Because the more we know, the more we grow. Um, that was, was like, PBS or something, I don't know, but something from my childhood that probably a lot of yours too, I don't know. Um, so all of these different parts of us are our identity. It's a, we're whole people. I just like, I can't emphasize that enough. Some parts are static and some stay, um, which means they stay the same and some are dynamic, which means they're constantly changing. You know, today I'll call myself a home bread baker, but when I, in the winter time, when I'm like kind of done baking bread, I know I bake bread in the summer, which is silly too, um, dropping stuff too. But um, when I wanna like bake cookies, I might call myself a biscuit baker. Like who knows, like that changes. Um, I'm an optimist. At some point that might change though, but my um, citizenship is staying the same. The fact that I was like born and raised into a um, English speaking home and that is the language that I speak, that is gonna stay the same for me. My race stays the same, my ethnicity stays the same. Thanks Mal, Mal said it's NBC, the more you know, the more you grow. And then there was like a rainbow too. I am a child of the 80s and early 90s, so if anybody else is, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm gonna call it the reading rainbow generation. Um, 
and that I don't know. I don't know if that's okay, but that's what I'm gonna do. So going with identity too. Thank you so much for sharing who you are too. I'm seeing other bakers, um, other people who there are parts of us that are similar, that are different. I love how Adrian shares, I'm the daughter of Carol, the daughter of Barbara. Um, I am the daughter of Jillian and the daughter of Stanley. And the, sometimes we can go, I can go really, and my mom's side of the family, I can go pretty far back with saying who I'm the daughter of and the granddaughter of. And on my dad's side, it, it stops pretty abruptly. So there are also like parts of us that we know and parts of us that we don't know um, and that we're always striving to know a little bit more too. Tina, I love that we have static and dynamic identities too. And I think that is really um, powerful and important for us to know as we kind of share that with ourselves and we share it with children. Um, I remember like, like children are very concrete. So we're, sometimes we think we're gonna be the same and get stuck, but there are parts of us, like we're just constantly growing. And so I think that's so important for us to like be aware of. So there, um, a very important part of me, of my identity, is my race. It's the part I think about all the time. Um, and it's a part that other people kind of are always wondering and questioning about. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten the question, what are you? No, like really, what are you? Which like, please don't ever ask somebody that. It's just, it's rude. Um, and that my answer to that has changed so much over time from me being like, I don't understand what you're saying when I was younger to being like, I'm a human to now I'm just like, well, what are you? Um, so there, the parts that I think about a lot are my race and, and, and my ethnicity. Um, and they're kind of like two different categories that get lumped together all the time. And I'm gonna tell you a little story. So we were filling out our insurance forms um, and because in the United States, uh, we our insurance, our healthcare is tied to employment. So we were filling out healthcare um, because when we change employment, we have to change our whole healthcare, which seems bonkers to me. It's a lot of paperwork, but um, we were filling it out and there were some categories for race and those i can remember the categories were black african-american um, white caucasian asian native indian um i can't remember the other categories and then there was a category for ethnicity and there was one thing to check for ethnicity which was hispanic and i was like looking and i was like hold up like there's like a whole bunch of other parts of it like I have ethnicity too, but according to that checklist, I didn't have one because I don't have um, Latinx indigenous heritage from South America um, in this, like the Southern Americas. So that doesn't mean I don't have ethnicity. So I want to read a little bit from the book. Let me see if I can find it. I have all these like different things tagged for us to read and look at. So this is like chapter three. This is like the teacher in me, chapter three, um, page 24, if anybody wants to <laughs> follow along. I recently did a summer program for young folks and they were all like, wait, 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 what, what page are you on? We have to read along. Uh, so the concept of race is actually, is not actually based on science. It's a creation of society. The categories for race have been created over many years by people in the dominant culture. In the mid 1700s, European scientists started to classify people just as they categorize plants and animals. We still study some of them today, like Carl Linnaeus and Johann Friedrich Blumenbach in our schools. Their science created a hierarchy of humans, which placed Europeans with the lightest skin at the top. Indigenous folks and those with the darkest skin were not valued. So like, like race and ethnicity are um, socially constructed, parts of our identity, social identities, how we're relating to others. They're not based in science. Um, uh, it's like a faulty science that they're sharing with us. So um, to go on further, I, in the book, I talk about the difference between race and ethnicity. And um, one of the examples I wanna share with you is like my race is black biracial. 
So it's based on um, ra race is based on our skin color, uh, characteristics that are passed down from generation to generation. Um, I have people in my family who have more melanin than other people in my family because I'm biracial and um, based on hair texture, kind of some of our features, that's what the category race is based on. But ethnicity is based on um, your cultural identity, your heritage. It is also a social construction and it doesn't look at our physical features, but it's more based on our cultural familial heritage. So when I say like my race is black biracial, my ethnicity is African-American, English, British, French, Irish, and then there's other parts of myself that I don't know. So do you see the differences between race and ethnicity? So now we're gonna take a, take a breath. And I have a couple questions for you because we're gonna do a little work. What do you know about your ethnic identity? Is this something you think and talk about often? What do you know about your racial identity? Is this something that you think about and talk about often? So in the chat box, if you're comfortable, and even if you're not, because with a discomfort comes growth. Remember those growing pains you had when you were, I remember my growing pains when I was like seven, eight, would keep me up at night. Like my legs were growing and it was just like, ah. Um, but what do you know about your ethnic identity? Do you talk about it a lot? Or do you not talk about it at all? And then maybe think about why. What do you know about your racial identity? Is this something you think and talk about often? So just pause for a moment, take a deep breath, do a little reflection. You can reflect in the chat box if you'd like. And these are these kind of like activities that I'm sharing with you are all ones that are in the book. If you have the book, you might've done them already, or maybe you're gonna pull it out later and do it. You can buy, um, you can get it at Barnes and Noble. You can also get it through, um, get the ebook if you're like, I need to read it now. Um, so there are parts of me that like my ethnic heritage, we talked about a lot in my family. Uh, the British Irish side, I'm a first generation American. So I've grown up with um, tea with a little sugar and a little milk uh, coming home from school to my grandparents' house, a square or two of Cadbury chocolate. Like that was a part of it. Um, eating things like lamb with mint sauce, um, some pretty non-traditional American things. The 4th of July didn't really mean anything to my family. Thanksgiving was a time for people to get together. Uh, I think this all kind of helped me as I was a kid to really question some of the things that were happening. Um, I remember being like, why am I pledging allegiance to a flag? Uh, especially like it had no relation to my family and it didn't really mean anything to me. Um, so I was like that kid that was sitting down at her desk. Uh, um, I was also questioning why are we learning about Christopher Columbus and remember my poem in sixth grade that I wrote that I'm not so sure the teacher really liked it that much. So um, that kind of part, that being a first generation American allowed for me to really question some of the things that were happening in school and what I was learning. And then um, also having a black biracial identity allowed for me to also look a little deeper and question like, why are my teachers nicer to me when I'm, you know, call, like calling them out and stuff, just like my darker friends. So those are, knowing those parts of my identity were really important. Um, I'm gonna, now I'm looking through some of your comments. Thank you so much for participating. It's always optional. You never have to share if you don't want to. I don't ever remember talking about this, honestly. Yeah. And especially like maybe we talked about race, but only in hushed tones, or maybe we talked about it as affirmations. I know that my mom was very um, good at letting us know that we were black and black is beautiful. Um, 
artist Keely, I think about it often. I'm an African American. I love what you're all sharing in the chat. Thank you. Recently, I've started thinking and talking about my ethnicity as an Ashkenazi Jew, especially in contrast to some of my friends who are Sephardi Jews. We are so similar in some ways and different in others. Talk about it a lot and refer to a child of first generation Americans as American, as still like American. My family is proud. So I'll, the other question I have for you, is it like easier for you to talk about your race or ethnicity? And why? And this is like, you don't have to share it in the chat box, but just think about it. Why is it easier for you to talk about one over the other? And it's kind of like building a muscle. So like talking about race, you're building that muscle. You know, when I was a kid, I was like really fascinated with other black biracial people. Like I didn't see a lot of people in the media like me and now there's a bunch and we're all just kind of like considered ambiguous too. Um, but it's a muscle, right? To like know your race and the pr privileges that it holds, if, if, it, if it holds privilege. And I know mine does. So being able to like talk about it and stuff too. Um, and for those of you who are white and identify as white or light, um, white passing, like really build up that muscle to be able to talk about it because um, it's really important to be able to name who you are and to recognize the, the privilege and immunity that comes with being white and light skin. So the other, so like looking at time too, um, cause I'll be taking some questions and like, I could do this all day, by the way. So the other thing I wanted to share with you is the definition of racism that I use when I'm talking about racism. Um, and I really like this definition. Um, it, it partly came from a training that I went to years ago. Um, I don't know if you can see that. This is like, I'll find a way to share the slides with you too. I'll share them over on social media. But racism is personal prejudice and bias and the systemic misuse and abuse of power by institutions. A lot of times when we talk about race or when you look in the dictionaries, um, people are referring to the personal side, the prejudice. And so they're like, hey, I'm nice, so I'm not racist or whatever. Uh, but there's that whole other part, um, the systemic misuse and abuse of power by institutions. Power is really key in understanding how racism works. Systemic is something that happens throughout a whole system and it's over the course of time. Institutions are, are our established laws, policies, rules, customs, procedures that are a part of the, our culture, our way of being. Uh, institutions hold power. They have been around for years, decades, centuries. People are a part of institutions, um, but people are not themselves institutions. Some examples of institutions are um, government, media and entertainment, housing, business, education, healthcare, the criminal justice system, to name some. So one thing I always ask young folks is what institutions have a direct impact on you? Education is the one that comes up so much. Healthcare, criminal justice system, um, depending on who, who you are and where you live, especially too, because there are some parts of our country that are extremely over-policed. Um, and we know from what is like the what has been happening for decades and centuries with Philando Castile, Elm Sterling, Stephen Lawrence in England, um, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Sandra Bland, so many folks, and until that our system, our institutions do not do the work of protecting black folks and indigenous folks. So really naming that too is like some institutions, depending on who you are and the color of your skin might be working for you or working against you with those policies and those procedures and using that power in a, in a, in a, a misused and abused way. So um, also thinking like, what is power? 
um, people hold power. Our institutions hold a lot of power, especially when we look at how um, um, lobbying, ha um, how different institutions lobby to get certain laws put in place. Um, so just those are some questions I always ask when we're thinking of institutions. And thank you folks for sharing like what parts or what institutions have a direct impact on you too. Like trying to think of time. Started at four. We've got a little bit more time. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to share with you is I want you to notice who has power and how they hold on to that power. How do they, whether they yield it. So one thing I always ask young folks is who's the principal of your school? Who's the superintendent? Who's running the school board? And notice their skin color. Notice um, how they hold on or hoard power or how they redistribute and yield that power. Um, and if you have the book, this is kind of the page where I ask folks to do that work. Who runs the biggest corporations? Who are the teachers? We know that about, I think it's like 82% of the teaching force is white folks. Um, who are the newscasters that we get our news from? Who, do, who are we kind of conditioned and taught to believe? So those are some kind of questions and things to, to, for us to think about as we're looking at how um, race and power go together and how we are also kind of taking in through the institutions of media or schooling, um, different stories about ourselves, which leads me into um, stories and the power of stories. And this is like me just like, I'll just keep going. I'll, I'll go really fast too, and I'm sorry. So I'm gonna read a little bit from here too. If stories of resistance and accomplishments are purposely left out of our history books or told from the perspective of those in the dominant culture, we have no voice. No one knows who we are and that we exist. The legacy we are left with is one that has been shaped by the oppressors. I think so much of what I learned in school and now like what I have to unlearn um, and kind of relearn and my friend Britt like shared last week in our um, ABAR at home course, ABAR is anti-bias, anti-racist, anti-racist parenting course. Um, we as adults are unlearning and then learning while our children are learning. So thinking about that too. So with stories, our history begins with us and it also like came way before us. When we're thinking of history, I want you to think about where does your story begin? I can think of my story began in the day I was born, or I could think it began when my family came over for me, or when my parents met, right? When my mom and dad met. I could also think of when my family came over from England. I could think of even previously, I could go further back, and I can keep going back. And there's also parts of my history that didn't directly involve me. Um, what stories from my life have shaped who I am at this moment? And then what stories have always been told or what ones do I, am I still yearning to know about? What is the history beyond my family and myself? Is it related to the land that I'm on? What moments in our collective history have had a large impact on me and my family in this moment? I think so much of um, the Lovings, Mildred and Richard Loving and how their story made it possible for, for me to be able to claim my identity as a black biracial person. Um, sometimes we'll claim the, the phrase, the, we're from the loving generation. Um, how did these moments contribute to who you are now? And I've noticed that the more I know about history and in the more I know about true history, the more I feel like I know about myself. This truth is so important for me to understand who I am and how I interact um, with the world around me, who I'm going to fight for and what I'm going to fight for um, is so important. And so knowing our history has real, is really 
uh, like lost my train of thought. But knowing our history helps us to know ourselves better too. So gonna kind of like wrap up. If you have questions, you can start popping them in the chat box and um, I'll answer them in a moment. But all these activities that I shared with you are in the book um, and I'm gonna like tell you a little secret. We're working on a journal that's gonna go along with the book. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, and I wanted to share some of like the, my favorite books right now that I've been reading with young folks. Um, of course, Stamped from Jason Reynolds and Ibram X. Kendi, love this book. I love Stamped from the beginning. Um, and this is a much more like accessible way to understand it. And then you can get, dive in deeper. Thank you, thank you, artist Keely. I really appreciate you. Um, Lifting as we climb, Black women's ballot or battle for the ballot box by Yvette Dion. I'm going to post a list of these books tomorrow on my social media. You can follow me um, at Tiffany M. Jewel, uh, Jewel with two L's. It's like one of like the things I'm always like, ah, um, when people spell it wrong. Um, a Different Mirror, so a young people's version by Ronald Takaki, A Different Mirror for Young People, a History of Multicultural um, America. I've used this in a classroom with uh, six to nine year olds. Um, there's an adult version too, which is really great, but these are books for young folks. And an indigenous people's history of the United States, Roxanne Dunbar, and um, adopted, adapted by Jean Mendoza and Debbie Reese, Dr. Debbie. And Howard Zinn's The Young People's History of the United States. So these are, um, these, Three books are ones that I've used with six to nine year olds in my classroom. And it's more like I support them um, in understanding it. And then this one, which I love, R is for, oh, I don't know if you can see it from the shine. R is for reparations. It's global from the Global African Congress from Nova Scotia. So it's from Canada. Um, it's really cute. And my friend Amelia like was reading through it last year and I just wanted her to do story time with it. Uh, young Native Activist Growing Up in Native American Rights Movement. And sorry for the glare, but again, I'll share these on social media tomorrow. And Christian Robinson, You Matter. I love Christian Robinson. Um, and I read this to like a bunch of middle schoolers a couple of weeks ago and they were like really excited for it too. We all, we all need picture books. Um, Let's see, what else? Oh, I had tons of books, by the way. Uh, Never Caught, the story of Una Judge, the young people's version. Um, that's by Erica Armstrong Dunbar and Kathleen Van Cleve. Resist by Veronica Chambers. Wish I had like five hands right now. Henry Louis Gates and Tanya Bolden's Dark Sky Rising. And I also love, it's like over out of reach, but Tanya Bolden's um, book, Saving Savannah, I really love. And Just Mercy, The Young People's Version. So these are all like books that I would recommend for folks who are um, like nine and up. To, and really like, I don't know the kids in your lives, but you know them and what they can handle. Um, I also really encourage folks to, to just read along with kids. Um, so let's see. I'm going to scroll through and see if y'all have any questions. So yes, the unlearning and relearning is such hard work. It really is. And like, you can do it. We can all do this. How do I get permission to use your book in the classroom this coming year with your students? Um, you can contact the folks at Quarto if you're like one, if you're wanting to record or whatever, but um, you can buy the book in bulk. And I know I, I keep, I've asked them about um, bulk ebook orders because the virtual learning is a thing that is happening for many of us. So, I mean, and you can ask the folks at Quarto 
uh, Quarto, Q-U-A-R-T-O, about, um, about permission. Stamp from the marks are being stamped at the beginning. Yep. It's a lot like you got to take it. I actually like listen to the audiobook multiple times to really help me. I'm I process nonfiction um, differently than I do fiction and hearing it helps me better. And considering how I might approach this book and activities with my high school students, I'm also at a loss for adapting it to virtual learning because of COVID distance learning suggestions. I know, and like, here's the thing. I think we all need, like, as an educator, and like, virtual learning, we can do this. It was really hard because crisis learning is a thing and we can, we can do it, we can be better at this. So with um, Stan from, or Stan, with uh, this book is Interesis, what I did with it, I did a whole virtual summer camp to kind of test things out and it worked really well. Um, and so I used the book kind of as a foundation and we went through kind of each, it was for a week. So we went through each section in a day. I gave the kids kind of homework to read and we got to go deeper with um, really like creating a history, a timeline history and understanding what it means to disrupt and creating our plans of action. So I used the book as a framework and then kind of built up from there. Um, and Mark, I am really like, I'm a big dreamer of things and I really am hoping to host a kind of like teach in for teachers on how to use the book. Um, but that's something I need to like process on what that looks like for you all. Um, I will be putting these book recommendations on social media. You can follow me at Tiffany M. Jewel. Toddler age recommendations. Um, our favorite favorite was uh, Bell Hooks B-Boy Buzz illustrated by Chris Roshka. And I don't, my kids are not toddlers anymore. So we don't have a lot of those in the house. I also really love um, Chenna Ewing's uh, E for Equality, which is like such a great, like gives us that language to use. And then we can kind of go from there. Um, with toddlers, I always uh, encourage um, books with real photos or realistic illustrations that uh, depict black and brown and indigenous folks in joyful, um, being joyful, being ourselves. Um, so those are kind of what I recommend for young folks. I can try to think of some more to add to um, the list that I can share. And there are also some really great lists out there too for, um, going around in social media. Okay, this is me like looking through. I don't have my reading glasses on, but I have my blue blockers on and I need to just get those merged together. I would like um, I love the selection of books and would like to recommend some of our teachers at our all white except me primary school. How might I introduce the topic of sharing it with students? Are there accompanying teaching guides? There is a teacher guide for this book is anti-racist and you can, um, the Quarto page. Oh, I love, like, if you want to use the book in your classroom, email Mel who has her email um, in the chat. Um, but the, the Quarto page that, uh, you find this book is anti-racist on. It has an educator guide and a family guide. And there's a lot of information in there, including book recommendations. A lot of these are in there too. And it's a free download. And you can also download some awesome posters to hang up in your class. This is one of them. So there's a question, do I believe African-Americans, black folks should be paid reparations? I absolutely do. Um, and that can look, uh, so I think redistributing wealth is really important. I also think acknowledging the, um, the vast uh, pay gap and um, really I think institutions could be working on um, equalizing that, providing better health care, providing better housing, like reparations looks really different in different ways, but um, we live in a very inequitable society and uh, it is possible to, to, um, to, to write it. Is 
if you have, so I'm not gonna get through all these questions, I'm sorry. And if you have more, you can definitely like um, join my Patreon. Uh, I think it's anti-bias Montessori. I can't type in the chat, otherwise I would for you. Um, but if you follow me on social media, you'll be able to find it because I answer a lot of questions in um, through Patreon too. Um, Okay, any other questions? One of the things that I think is really important for us to do is to keep learning and growing. Uh, so reading is a way we can do that. What books do you have that are available for you to continue your research to do more? What can you write? Keeping a list, a notebook. I have lists everywhere, um, like <laughs> hand researching. Where can you, thank you for that. Um, where can you find more information online? There's so many places. Um, where do you start? I always go with listening to black women. That's like my go-to when I'm kind of like, what do I need to do? Um, uh, and that's like a great place to start. And if you have kids in your life, young folks, like work, work with them and generate those questions too. They're really fun. Like what stories get told? How can we do this? What do we want to know more about? Um, and I think that's kind of it. It's 4.50. Thank you all for hanging in. Remember, you can get this at Barnes & Noble. Um, it is in stock. So get it while it's in stock. And you can also get the ebook. Um, so beautiful. And also, like, I don't know if you know, but these are like nice, thick, glossy pages. I'm also going to share while I'm here. Why not share this quote from Yuri Kochiyama? I love it. Transform yourself first because you are young and have dreams and want to do something meaningful that in itself makes you our future and our hope. I love everything about this book. Also follow Aurelia. Um, and if you follow me, like I'll keep shouting out Aurelia too. But thank you for joining us today. I love seeing like all the like love and thank yous in the end. Um, Keely, you should definitely like, I. everybody needs to share their story. Write your story, please share it. 